Hello, everyone. Thank you for organizing this. This is pretty awesome. I hope that this happens again while that is loading. I'm going to talk to you today about the role of offline replay in planning. And you might think, why would planning have to do something with offline replay? And my answer is because planning is hard. And you're usually time constrained. You need to grab coffee before a conference. You don't want to miss awesome talks. But at the same time, you need to plan whether you go upstairs or downstairs to get coffee first. Um, we often need to integrate different pieces of information we've gathered at different points in time in order to be able to plan optimally. And although uh, following Tolman, a lot of people think that the way to do this would be to rule out everything at decision time, it would be way more useful, especially when we are time constrained and we're running away from a predator or we really need coffee, uh, to actually um, sort of integrate the information offline um, and um, not have to spend that much time at the decision time. So what I talk to you about today is can the brain piece together distally acquired episodes or information in order to create predictive um, sort of updating of representations that support planning. Um, in other words, uh, I'd like to suggest that uh, perhaps while you're sitting there um, uh, looking at a slide that is uh, presenting the Dyna model, you're piecing together information about where you can get coffee so that the next day you can optimally plan your reward trajectory. All right, just to um, uh, zoom a little bit back to um, uh, what, are the, uh, what the literature says about the role of replay, um, Tolman um, um, famously proposed that at the moment of decision, we roll out all of the uh, trajectories in a decision tree and then choose the one that is optimal uh, for reward. We have some evidence of this from a number of um, uh, incredible labs recently, especially the Foster Lab. Um, and uh, there is evidence from, uh, in humans from fMRI from the Dahl lab. Brad Dahl did this wonderful experiment uh, where he shows prospective activations in a two-step task. And we have shown some evidence for prospective memory. Um, and um, there is beautiful work by Elliot Wimmer and Daphna Shahami showing that uh, you would do online integration of associated memories at the moment where you're receiving feedback. Uh, but Although we have models like the Dyna architecture and we have behavioral evidence that offline replay might support planning, we don't have neural evidence as of yet that this actually is the case. Um, if you want to hear a little more about uh, the modeling and behavior that exists, um, uh, in, 90, in the 90s, um, there was the uh, proposal of the Dyna architecture, followed by further work by Sutton, Sutton and colleagues to propose that planning, one form of planning at least, could be learning from replay. And uh, more recently, we just got a paper accepted, uh, my collaborator Evan Rusek, who must be in the audience somewhere, uh, talk to him. And we also had some uh, behavioral evidence, uh, uh, both Sam Gershman and uh, some of our collaborations with him, that um, there's behavioral evidence that this does happen. Now, let's see if we can put all of these things together to design a task to figure out whether uh, we find neural evidence for this. Um, the kinds of uh, hypothesis and uh, predictions that um, such, a, uh, such an account uh, would have would first be that if we had some sort of a brain measure for offline replay, let's say from fMRI, that's my that's sort of poison of choice, um, and some planning behavior measure, then there would be a positive correlation between what happened before the moment that you were doing your behavior and then your planning behavior. A further important question is, uh, what kind of memories should be replayed to be relevant to the planning? There's so many things you could dream up and you could daydream about what is relevant. And what we're going to propose following prioritize sweeping, uh, also coming from the field of reinforcement learning for the CS-minded um, among you, um, uh, where you would encounter some experience and it has a prediction error, in this case, unsigned prediction error. We heard a lot about it earlier, which is pretty wonderful. Um, and then um, your brain might sort of figure out what other experiences are related to this. How did I come to this point uh, of receiving this and what follows it? And tag them with priority so that later on, when I've learned enough and the prediction error goes down, I can replay and update the representations accordingly. Um, there are some other uh, 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 sort of uh, side predictions that we have. For instance, we would expect more replay after higher prediction errors if the account that I just told you is the case. And um, there is some um, indirect evidence from some work that has been recently uh, coming out 
Also, we would predict that there would be more hippocampus and more ventromedial prefrontal cortex in the integration process. For the um, uh, neuroscience minded amongst you, you would know that uh, these are regions that are often involved in memory integration processes. Okay, let me start with the first um, uh, question, whether offline replay can piece together distal information to support planning. To test this, we use a multi-step sequential planning task. For the rodent neuroscientists, it's like stacking T mazes on top of each other. In this case, instead of rodents, we had Princeton undergrads. So I told them that the task is that they are a thief and they're supposed to look for money. This motivated them a lot. Their behavior was great. Um, so they would just go into, they would be this traveling thief who would go to different cities and they would face different sort of architectures. And they would need to explore this environment to find out where's the best money where at the test phase, they would go there and just uh, look for money. It's a two-stage decision because in every sort of context or city that they were, there was a stage one decision. They started at some point, in this case, it's a Berlin theater, um, and then they would choose left or right or up or down in order to explore this environment. And in this case, they could go, they had two stage two choices. They could go to the break room or they could go to the district room. And then from either of those states, when they arrive, then they have again another two choice. So that's the stage two choice. Now, um, half of the trials, half of these cities were in the revaluation condition and half of them were in the control condition. The assignment was to randomize across subjects. I'm just going to uh, first tell you a structure of a trial in the revaluation condition. So in the learning phase, they encounter 30 or more times until they learn what is going on with the, environment, uh, with the uh, structure of the world. Once they've learned that, in the relearning phase, they no longer go to make a stage one decision. They only make a stage two decision. And so in the revaluation condition, the rewards have changed, as you notice, but the participant gradually finds this out as they're exploring. In the middle of this relearning phase, as they're figuring out and they're experiencing prediction errors, oh no, the break room doesn't pay me in the same way, um, they have three rest periods of 30 seconds each, and all of my fMRI analysis would be focused on that other than the prediction error analysis. And then at the test phase, um, we throw them back into the starting point at that stage one, and we're like, all right, now where do you want to go? If they had integrated the new information they acquired during the relearning phase in their evaluation condition, they should change where they were going. The control condition, nothing changed. So they should be persisting on whatever it was that they learned was the optimal choice in the learning phase. All right, as a measure of behavioral plan replanning score, we can compare now that stage one decision um, uh, here at the test phase after they had experienced the relearning phase with the uh, same decision during the learning phase and see how that has differed. The, to the extent that they had shifted their decision, that would give us a replanning score. Let's see how they did. Um, so the more positive you are in this re uh, replanning score, it means that you revalued or you changed or you had a reversal of what you were doing before. And the more negative you are, it means uh, not only did you not change, you actually are more likely to choose um, um, the, the, what you were choosing in the first uh, learning phase. As you can see, uh, there is a clear difference between the revaluation condition and control condition in the replanning, but there are individual differences. And all I'm going to show you now is that the evidence for replay during those rest periods is going to uh, correlate with these individual differences. All right, so I'm going to focus now on only the rest periods of the relearning phase. Um, and recall that we have different MDPs, and in all of our Markov decision processes, stage one and stage two stimuli are from different categories. Whether it's faced or seen in stage one or stage two is sort of randomized across the trials. However, it's always a different category. So what I can do is I can look during these rest periods. I have trained my classifier, and we tried many different classifiers. What I'm going to show you is from logistic regression. Um, to look in the scene selective and face selective regions and look for evidence for faces and scenes trained on localizer when people are looking at them and then tested on TR by TR during these rest periods to look at evidence that the person is reinstating faciness or sceniness. Okay, now if I have the distribution of the behavior, replanning behavior on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, I have the evidence for replay of that stage one stimulus. Let's see what the relationships are. So first, you can see here uh, the Spearman, and also this is the regression line, um, that there is no significant correlation in the control condition. So the amount that you're replaying doesn't show what you're doing, uh, doesn't correlate with what you're doing later on. 
In the revaluation condition, however, we would expect a positive correlation in case my hypothesis was correct. And that is indeed what we see. Both the regression and the Spearman shows that there is a positive correlation um, between them. Now, is the, the direction of the correlation significantly different between them? For this, we did a bootstrapping analysis where I threw all the subjects in a bag and then pulled out 24 with replacements. So we could do this 1,000 times and compute the correlation. And this bootstrapping revealed that there is a significant difference between the correlation in the two conditions, even if I sample subjects differently. All right, now, nice, that was one of our main results. Just to flash it again, we see that uh, evidence for offline replay uh, during rest is correlated with uh, replanning behavior later on. Beautiful. Now, brain's response to uncertainty or unsigned prediction error drives replay. This was our second hypothesis. So if I, had a, uh, if I modeled uh, the prediction error during the learning with, <clears throat> uh, with a given learning rate for the subject, and then I measured how the brain um, or different brain regions, their response would be modulated by the amount of unsigned prediction error um, that the subject is experiencing, and then saw whether that can predict the amount of offline replay later on and the amount of revaluation magnitude later on because we saw that there was a relationship here, as you remember. It is indeed what we see, and we looked at the entire brain. We see that the striatum and ACC mid-cingulate are especially, and actually also the posterior medial cortex that you don't see here, are regions that um, uh, they're, the extent to which they are modulated by the unsigned prediction error during learning predicts how much subjects are going to replay later on and also how much they're going to replan or show evaluation behavior. Third, uh, uh, we had some side predictions that, for instance, after higher prediction error, you would see higher replay or that hippocampus and VMPFC would show higher univariate activation during the replay of revaluation trials. And here you see the model uh, estimated prediction errors prior to each rest period in the revaluation condition. And just prior to rest one, you have the highest amount of unsigned prediction error. And the reason that this is non-zero in general is that there is some variance around the mean for the reward that people are receiving. And then uh, at this case, in this case, you, have, you see the z-score are sort of normalized per every sort of run, every fMRI session, per every city MDP. Um, uh, replay scores, and you can see that uh, just after uh, subjects had experienced the highest amount of prediction error, you see the highest amount of offline replay as well. All right, and if I look at a univariate contrast, uh, contrast between the rest periods of the revaluation uh, trials and the rest periods of the control trials, I would see that um, the hippocampus and VMPFC ACC show higher activation during this period. All right, our main two hypotheses uh, were that offline replay would support planning and that memory stack with uncertainty or PE might be replayed more and support um, this sort of uh, relationship. And to just give you an integrative summary, um, uh, we find that uh, the extent to which the striatum and the cingulate are responsive to prediction errors during learning and relearning phase uh, predicts the extent of offline replay, and there seems to be evidence for um, uh, memory and updating processes during these rest periods, and the extent of this replay also predicts revaluation behavior, um, as you can see. Finally, what is the function of replay? Um, so, um, as I mentioned, you experience an event, it has some surprise, you look at all of the other events that are related to this, and you tag them with, uh, with um, priority because of this uncertainty to be replayed later on. Once you learn the new contingencies associated with this surprise that you've experienced, you can now replay and update um, information associated with that. And in general, during sleep and uh, waking rest, you can generalize over multiple scales and update your abstractions um, uh, and update your representations. And it's not just pretty graphs. We're doing more simulations and more modeling work uh, with the spread of activation. Um, uh, ask me about it afterwards. Thank you, CCN, my collaborators, the Computational Memory Lab, and for your attention. Shoot me an email if you want a preprint. Your study, it seems that people probably 
consciously and purposefully reporting information that you just gave them. Is there, is there a difference that you see? Uh, do you think of it as conscious rehearsal on purpose or automatic? I don't, and I think that it should happen in sleep too, although there would be differences between them. We also asked the participants afterwards with extensive questionnaires whether they were thinking about this and what they were thinking about. Many of them didn't report at all thinking about the task. They, they were focusing on, for instance, somebody was itchy, somebody was resting, somebody was resting their hand. Um, I don't think that consciousness is necessary for the replay process to work well, but goal-directed um, ness is necessary so that you have things that are related out of so many things that you could replay that the brain would uh, replay that. And the more there is some reward involved or there is some uh, motivation involved, I think the more it's likely that the brain would do its job properly offline.